I'm Marianne Moenraj. Um, I'm the director of the Speculative Literature Foundation, and we're here today to do a panel on what editors want. Um, it was originally scheduled to have uh, Lynn Murray Thomas and Neil Clark. Uh, Neil is from Clark's World Magazine. He had a family emergency and had to step off the panel today. Um, so we're hoping to have him back in a few months for a similar panel. But in the meantime, Judd Hartman has kindly stepped in. So I'm going to do very brief bios, um, and then we're just going to dive into it. So uh, I'll start with Judd. Uh, Judd and I worked with a bunch of people many years ago to found Strange Horizons. Um, I somehow managed to talk Judd into becoming senior fiction editor, a position he held for, I think, 12 years, um, from 2000 to 2012. Is that right? I think I got that yes. right. Yay, I researched in advance, but then my memory failed me. So, um, so good. And uh, he stepped down at that point, and he now is the editor of Constellation Press, which does um, some reprints of texts he likes. Um, they've brought out an edition of Cyrano de Bergerac recently and uh, Delaney's memoir, Heavenly Breakfast. Um, uh, they publish uh, round singing uh, scores, not scores, lyrics. Recordings. Recordings, recordings. Teaching recordings. Teaching recordings. And uh, hope to do new anthologies in the future. So you can keep an eye out for that. Um, and Lynn Thomas, oh, and in his day job, he's a tech editor at Google. Tech writer, tech writer and editor at Google. So um, does much of this in his day job as well. Uh, Lynn Murray Thomas is uh, a librarian, archivist, and editor, um, and probably other things as well. Um, she has won many Hugos for her work at this point. I believe it's up to nine Hugos. Um, the first Hugo was for Chicks Dig Time Lords, which I was very happy. Judd and I actually had a piece in that um, about our love for um, John Barrowman's character, um, Captain Jack. So... So it was, it was great to be in there. And she has since gone on to win, um, I believe, Hugo's for podcasts, um, mostly the last several years for her work on Uncanny Magazine um, with her husband, Michael Damien Thomas, and I believe a crew of some other people who I don't know exactly who's working on Uncanny at the moment, but um, it's a terrific magazine. I encourage you all to take a look. So, uh, and I think, and... I may, I'm going to try and mostly be moderator, but my editorial experience um, that's relevant to science fiction fantasy is mostly that I edited an anthology, Survivor, um, uh, science fiction fantasy stories of trauma and survival. Um, and I have served as a short magazine, edit, short fiction magazine editor at various points in the past, but um, I don't have the stamina these two do to be able to do it on an ongoing basis for years. So I'm going to start with just some very basic questions uh, for beginners uh, in the audience. Um, when they are getting ready to send a story to you, um, I assume that you would like them to read your magazine, read your publication first, that you'd recommend that because editors always say that. Um, but what else would you like them to think about um, before putting that maybe that first story in the mail? What, what process would you like them to go through? I have a lot of, I teach creative writing at the university level. So every semester I have students who are about to submit their first story anywhere ever. Um, so what would you say to them? Uh, and I'm sorry, I, you could jump in or I can, I can call on you. I'll call on Lynn to start, so. Sure. Um, so I think that from a very baseline point of view, the main thing is making sure that you are happy with the version of the story that you are sending in and that to you as a writer, it feels complete and ready to go. Um, we are particularly interested in stories that have reached that level of doneness because when you are entering the pile of submissions, you are amongst, in our case, anywhere from 2,500 to 3,000 of your colleagues who are doing the same thing. And um, the first stories that end up getting rejected are the ones that are just not quite cooked. Um, so that I think is a key thing, is making sure that you're happy with where the story is at before you submit it. 
Um, the, the other thing is that um, the process for getting to happy with your story should hopefully include having someone who is not you read your story and give you feedback on it. Um, ideally, it's other folks who are also interested in writing, particularly interested in writing the kinds of things that you want to be writing, but not always. Sometimes it's helpful to have someone who likes other stuff too, as long as they're well read and they have opinions and are willing to ask questions, they can serve as beta readers very easily. Um, and you know that you have worked your story to the point where you don't feel that you can make it any better than it is, that it's really ready and you need to let it be out there and set it free. Um, for some folks, that's the hardest part is figuring out when you're done with a story because you can tinker and tinker and tinker and tinker and never send it out. Um, so finding the way to get to your version of done where you can put it out there and see what happens is, is I think in many ways, the hardest part. Yeah. One thing I tell my students is that it helps for me to think about like, you know, how artists have a blue period or, you know, they have, you talk about visual artists in that way. And so I kind of think like, okay, my work is like this now I'm in this period. Sure. In 10 years, I may look back on it and think, oh, I could do it so much better now, but, but that's all right. That was during my blue period. And now I'm in purple. <laughs> and so um, you don't need to wait till you get to purple before you start sending things out, or you will have a very short career that will happen in the very last years of your life. That would be sad. Um, Jed, what do you want to do? Want to throw something in here? Uh, I'll say a couple of things, but first I want to have uh, added a disclaimer that um, uh, Neil, who was going to be here, is a current editor of a major magazine in the field. I have not been an editor of short fiction for the last 10 years, so um, there may well be things that I am not up on, and Lynn, I hope that you will correct me if I say anything that's outrageously out of line. Uh, I am, as Marianne said, hoping to do um, anthologies, but uh, have not done that yet. Uh, so in terms of, of what beginners should go through when they're preparing to send in a story, I agree with everything Lynn said, but um, I would also say to some degree, it, it, for some people, it can be very helpful to not overthink it. To um, I know that a lot of people early in their writing uh, think in terms of writing one brilliant story. And so they spend a lot of time polishing that one brilliant story. They send it in and then they sit back and wait and they get a, a response from the first place they send it. And so they send it somewhere else and they spend a year sending it out to various magazines and waiting for that one story to be the thing that, that launches their career or that makes them famous or whatever. And um, I think that it can be really helpful to think instead in terms of that one story being one among many stories that you're going to write. Mm -hmm. You write the story, you, you polish it as, as well as you can, um, and then you send it in and you go work on another story and you send that in. And um, don't, don't get too focused on the one story that you've sent. Um, you, you almost certainly have more than one story to tell. Uh, I guess, I guess the one other thing that I note is sort of a, a technical thing that in addition to, you don't necessarily, there won't necessarily be something that you can read that Marianne mentioned, like, you know, with, with Uncanny or Clark's World, you, you definitely should read what they published. Um, if I'm doing an anthology, you'd have a harder time doing that, but you should research the venue. You should find out what sorts of things they have in their guidelines. Um, you should uh, just get a sense of, of what they're for before you before you send them something. And that doesn't mean that you should, you should, you shouldn't restrict yourself. You shouldn't say, oh, well, you know, they say that they're looking for um, this particular kind of thing. And I'm not quite sure whether my thing is that kind of thing. There's, there's a balance to be struck there. Um, and, and Lynn might want to say more about, about where on that balance to, to find yourself. Um, but it is, it is useful to have some idea of what they're looking for. Yeah, I think that one of the things that it's important to underline is that every single venue has um, a different editor and every editor has their own taste and their own approach and their own likes and dislikes. So just because some, just because the story is not a good fit for the first venue you send it to does not mean it may not be a good fit for venue number 14 when you get to that point. Everybody 
um, who becomes an editor firmly believes that they have good taste, but our good taste varies wildly in terms of what we consider to be a good story. It's not an objective thing where we're sitting with a rubric and saying it, it ticks all these boxes. Yeah. Um, it is very much a subjective thing where a person who has the wherewithal to spend time and money doing this for love and a tiny bit of money um, can sit down and say, this blew me away. I want to share this with the world. So um, my favorite way to illustrate this is when we were starting on Canny, um, we were still in the process of running our Kickstarter for the first year. And Sarah Pinsker, who was one of our solicited authors um, as part of that Kickstarter, sent us the story that she was planning that, you know, that she had for us. And she said, this is an uncanny story. And we were like, <laughs> the magazine doesn't exist yet. We don't know what an uncanny story looks like. But she was certain that her story was an uncanny story. And she was absolutely right. It was. Mm -hmm. um, we ended up publishing it and we loved it to bits. Um, and it's called When the Circus Lights Down. And it's about a, it's about a magical traveling circus and it involves clowns, which is usually a hard limit for me. I, am, I, I have a massive fear of clowns, but Sarah made it work. Um, and I think that's the other part of this is that we all have different likes and dislikes. You should absolutely read and follow the guidelines. If you send Uncanny a very horrific horror story, you're just gonna get rejected because we don't publish that. It's not what we're looking for. There are other great venues looking for those kinds of stories, but that's not what we do. Um, Clark's World and a couple of other venues have specific kinds of stories that they no longer want to see because they have seen too many of those kinds of stories. Um, you know, Mermaids Monthly is out there. And if you're going to send them a non-mermaid story, that maybe isn't the best option there because what they're looking for are mermaid stories. So it's things like that. Um, at the very baseline, you want to make sure that you are aware of the kinds of things that the venue publishes and that... Um, and, you know, reading the, the magazine is a good way to get an idea of the editor's taste. That's really what it comes down to. And it can be varied. Um, and in the case of Uncanny, because we have two editors in chief who are married to one another and bicker, um, there are some stories that are more my jam and some that are more Michael's, but we always select, item, select stories that work for both of us. Um, so there's not, you know, there's, there's never anything that is published where one of us lost an argument. We always come to agreement before something gets bought. But um, Michael tends to really like stories that have a lot more ambiguity. And I tend to, I tend to lean more towards, on occasion, more fluffy unicorn chasers, which is why you get the sort of mix of the two in the magazine, tonally. Um, we're often described as bittersweet. I think that's that's one of the <laughs> ways that we're characterized in terms of what we publish, which is really not wrong. Um, so yeah, it's it's about understanding where you're sending things and understanding that for the the editors on the opposite side reading all of those submissions, it is it is we say this over and over again, but it really isn't personal. When we reject a story, it is not a personal, I think you're a terrible writer and you should never write again. That is not what we are doing. We are saying, this story is not what I happen to be looking for in this particular moment. Yep. That's all it is. Um, and what we are looking for in any moment changes. Yeah. So, you know, and if you find that you get actual active feedback beyond a form rejection, um, that magazine or venue should go back to the top of your list because that means the editor took an extra few minutes to provide some feedback, which we cannot do when there are 3000 people submitting every time we're open to every single, like we don't, Scott Andrews, I don't know when he sleeps, bless him if he, <laughs> guys, because he provides personalized feedback to every single writer that submits to the magazine. And I literally don't know when he sleeps because we don't have the person power to do that at Uncanny. I wish we did, but we just don't. And um, if you do get personalized feedback, that means the editor stopped, liked your story enough to give you feedback, and is going to be looking for the next story when you send it to them, which you absolutely should, because now they remember your name and they're going to go, ooh, I saw something in the last story that they sent. I hope they send me more. When we say we can't wait to see the next story, that's not just a line. We actually do mean that. If we've given the additional time of providing in personal feedback, we do want to see the next story because the next story may be the right story at the right moment, even if the first one you sent wasn't. Yeah. 
I, I want to make I want to make sure that we have time to move on to other things, but I want to just add one more bit to that, which is that there there are equity issues here. Um, I don't know to what extent this is still true, but it used to be true that women in particular were much more likely to pre-reject their own stories, you know, to decide something must not be right for, for a given venue, and also to take rejections as meaning I should never write to them again. Um, I, I don't know to what degree that's changed, but um, I think that it's worth noting that there are some people who are much more self-confident um, in their, I shouldn't say self-confident, um, uh, confident that that they that nothing bad will happen if they, you know, bend the rules in various ways um, uh, and other people who are less so. So, so that, there are several things I wanted to, to just touch on that both of you brought up. So, um, so I'm going to hit a couple of them. One is the what Lynn says about actually following the submission guidelines. I, I would particularly emphasize genre there because, um, you know, for example, when I was editing Aqua Erotica for Random House, it was an erotica anthology. It was a water related erotica anthology. And people sent me things that had sex in them, but were not at all sexy or erotic. They were straight up horror, right? And so it was, it was very clearly, I've written this horror story with sex and water in it. So I, maybe they'll take it here. I will not take it here, <laughs> you know? So I, I would say definitely, um, I think follow the genre convention, the, the genres that they're requesting. Um, they're unlikely to bend that and you're sort of wasting your time and theirs by, by sending it um, to that market. When you finish a story and send it out, I think Lynn touched on this, but I wanted to just bring it out a little more. I would say once it's in the mail or in the email, start the next one, right? Have that be your plan is that, you know, I sent it out Saturday, Sunday is gonna be a writing day and I'm gonna start the next story because it's really easy to let weeks go by after you've put a story in the mail and not start writing it again. So um, a goal I have for myself is to have six stories out at any given time. I don't always make that. I have at points. Um, and you know those, that, those times are very productive times for me, but that's just what I aim towards. So something to think about. Um, Which doesn't mean that everyone needs to have six stories out at once. That's just an example. I set a goal for myself, Jen. Sure. <laughs> so <laughs> yes, my goals should be everybody's universal goals, clearly. No, um, but, and then I wanted to go back to the persistence thing that Jed mentions and specifically, not just gender, but marginalized communities generally. I think there's actually a ton of research that this is ongoing across fields. Um, and specifically, I mean, we did a survey at Strange Horizons that showed that women tended not to resubmit nearly as much as men did. After their second or third rejection from Strange Horizons, a lot of women just never submitted to us again, where men were continuing to submit a fifth story, a sixth story, a seventh story, and then maybe the eighth story is the one that actually finally gets bought, right? But if you don't make it to eight, then that's never going to happen. The, the research kind of shows that this is a, a reasonably good strategy in much of life if you have if you're from a marginalized community, you have fewer resources to draw on, there's a certain sense to cutting your losses and sort of saying, oh, well, this market isn't interested in the kind of thing I do, so I'll go look at other markets. Um, so, but it's, I would just say it's, it's somewhat counterproductive for publishing and especially publishing short fiction. Um, so it might, be, it might be a good strategy elsewhere in life. It probably is. But if your main goal is to get some short fiction published um, at a particular magazine, keep sending it to them. So, um, all right. So those were the things I wanted to add on to the fabulous things you guys said. Um, so shifting a little forward to people who have been um, who have who have done this now, they've been submitting for a while. They've got the process down. Maybe they've published a little bit in some places, but they haven't cracked your market yet, right? So could you talk? a little bit about what, what made stories stand out for you, right? And I had a grading scale when I was reading stories where I, because I'm an academic, I used A, B, C, D uh, grading to, to track things. 
And the vast majority of the stories I got, I would say, were B stories. They were perfectly competent, right? There was nothing technically wrong with them, but they didn't make me want to publish them. So what what takes something to that, like, ah, I have to be the person to put this out in the world? Um, Jed, do you want to start and then go to Lynn? Sure. Um, I, I think that for me, it's a very um, idiosyncratic kind of thing. Um, stories that make me cry, stories that make me laugh a lot. Um, but a lot of it is just this particular story just really grabbed me. Um, there are there are a lot of, of particular factors that I could point to. Um, uh, emotional engagement with characters is, is a big one for me. But uh, I think a lot of those things are things that somebody else who's reading the story might not necessarily have the same reaction, especially with humor, which is famously very individual, um, that, you know, it's, it's just going to be a story that, that really appeals to me. Okay. Lynn, do you have anything? Yes. Um, so here, here in uncanny land, um, we don't use a strict grading scale, although I would, I would definitely agree, Marianne, as a fellow academic, that yeah, most of what we see is quite good, but not quite there, which is a yeah. B-level story for us. Um, we talk around the house about our socks staying on or our socks getting knocked off. <laughs> we talk about stories that sing. Um, so the thing that makes a story transcendent for us here at Uncanny, um, there's, there's a bunch of different approaches. I mean, um, since one of our taglines is stories that make you feel much like Jed, we need to have an emotional attachment to the characters. It doesn't have to be a positive emotional attachment to the characters. You know, your characters need to be interesting, not necessarily always likable. If you can make your characters fascinating, even if they're very unlikable people, that's still workable. Um, for us, we do emphasize um, elegance of prose. And I use the word elegance advisedly because I realize it, it's a very charged term. Um, but what I'm trying to convey is that um, the things that we enjoy at Uncanny tend to have what we think of as elegance of execution. There is enough technical skill in the writing that you can provide pretty turns of phrase, pretty turns of phrase um, sentences that flow well together um, building of imagery that makes sense both thematically with the story and in terms of what you're actually trying to describe. Um, these are all things that take skill and time and practice. Um, we don't necessarily feel that prose needs to be strictly speaking invisible in the sense of like you just don't notice that it's there. It's fine for it to be noticeable, but we do know we do see that there's a tipping point between having something that is um, on a prose level, visibly pretty, but elegantly done. And what we end up referring to as word salad, um, where the words get in the way of the meaning. Um, and that's that's a difficult line to figure out where to stand on it to the and to, to self edit to the point where you get to the elegant part. Um, so that's, that's a challenging thing to do. Um, admittedly. Uh, we do like our stories to make sense, um, and we need them to make sense in ways that can be surprising. What we love are stories where, at the end of it, the outcome is not what we predicted, but if we go back to the beginning of it, it absolutely was seated at the beginning, and it makes complete sense from beginning to end, and that thing that at, that at the end, it was the, it was the, the ending was sudden but inevitable. Um, mm. Those are the kinds of things that we enjoy. We are not necessarily always keen on stories that have twists specifically, unless the twist makes sense and is structurally part of the story. So like what we need is our stories to make sense both, and they need to make sense emotionally. They need to make sense plot-wise. They need to make sense thematically. Um, a lot of the stuff that we end up rejecting is either because we don't connect enough with the characters or we don't understand the choices that they made because you've set up one set of stakes at the beginning of the story and made choices at the end of the story that don't match up with the stakes that you set at the beginning or you just aren't being mean enough to your characters. We've rejected stuff like that too where the conflict isn't sufficient to keep the story moving along. Um, and it doesn't need to be like direct conflict. Sometimes it's internal conflict. Sometimes it's, um, you know, 
there, there's lots of different ways to energetically move a story along. And the right one for the story is going to vary with the story that you're trying to tell. And figuring out which tools you're going to use to tell the story that you want to tell is, I think, one of the hardest parts of writing fiction. Because you have a lot of tools at your disposal and, and sometimes you just need that really tiny Phillips head screwdriver. And sometimes you need a hammer. But you can't mix up the two in the same story if the story is calling for a very tiny screwdriver and all you've got is a hammer. It's a terrible metaphor. This is why I'm an editor, not a writer. <laughs> I like it. Uh, something, a couple of things that you said reminded me of a couple more things that I wanted to mention. Um, one is that for me, seeing things that I haven't seen done before, something that's new to me is, um, is almost always a really good thing. Um, it's, it's not necessary. Um, there's many stories that I love that are, that are not doing incredibly new things. Um, and it's not necessarily sufficient on its own, but uh, it is a, a big selling point for me. Um, I too am a big fan of, of prose style and, and prose stylists. Um, I wanted to, to mention one spe very specific, I, I, I think this falls in the category of pet peeve, but about the phrase that Marianne used, crack the market. Um, the, the reason that I, it, it, that phrase has always bugged me. And the reason that I'm, that I'm taking the time to, to say so in this context is that I feel like it suggests a um, it can suggest a mindset in which you feel like if you only, you know, get the combination exactly right, if you just do this thing, then you will, you will crack, you will, you will solve the puzzle of, of how to get into this, um, you know, get published here. And, and it doesn't necessarily work like that. And there are, you know, we had a couple of people who sent us 20 stories over the course of 10 years and we didn't publish any of them. Um, and it wasn't a matter of, of breaking through our defenses. It wasn't a matter of, of solving the puzzle of what we wanted. It was just a mismatch between what they were doing and what we were looking for. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is one of the, 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 so this is the collective, there's no secret code speech. Um, there's no secret handshake. Um, <laughs> yes, and you'll hear this exactly. on every panel like this that you come to because folks, who are writing and are just getting into the industry feel like there's gotta be some specific way to navigate past these walls that is going to be the one that works. And the most consistent way of doing it is writing a really great story and then writing the next really great story and continuing to do that. Anything else is not actually what's gonna get you there. Um, there is no secret handshake. There is no secret code. I'm sorry. Like, I don't have time to, to mess with that stuff. I just end up getting locked in the safe myself, honestly. Like it's just not <laughs> So, um, you know, the other thing I think it's important to just emphasize is um, when you are communicating with markets, you need to be professional. Yes. Um, it's important to uh, understand that these are your colleagues. We're not ogres. We're not, di we're not dragons sitting on a horde. We are your colleagues. We are humans on the other end of this. And as much as it's difficult to hear the word no, and you will hear it a lot as a writer, um, it is important to understand that the no is not personal and the no is not malicious. It is just a, sorry, this was not for me. Um, the fastest way to get your name remembered in a negative way is to argue back or to um, become abusive towards the editor. Um, you, when you get a rejection, you aren't actually required to respond to it in a general sense. Like at best you could, you. you all you've done is create another email in my inbox that I have to respond to. Yeah. <laughs> and there's an awful lot of them. Sorry. That's one of the reasons many of us use systems to manage our submissions so that we aren't having to respond to 8,000 more emails of people saying, thank you. Um, because that's just time. Yeah. Um, but I mean, we're people, you know, and we, we are doing the best we can with the tools we have to hand. Um, which generally involve not enough time, not enough money, not enough sleep, same as you. Um, and that's, I think, important to keep in mind. Um, but there's no right way other than writing great stories, but great stories will be defined entirely differently yeah. by different markets. There are 
stories that we have published in Uncanny that have gone on to great success and award accolades that have been rejected by other markets. There are stories in other markets that I know for a fact we rejected at Uncanny that have gone on to great accolades and award nominations and wins. Yep. That's how it works. Mm -hmm. It's not that you know we were so stupid to pass it over and this other market picked it up and weren't they smart. It's that on that day when we read that story, it wasn't what we were looking for. And on that day when that other editor read that story, it was what they were looking for. That's really all it is. And I realize that it's hard when it's subjective like that, but that's really how it works. So I, I wanna argue with both of you, I disagree. So, <laughs> um, so and I, I guess I will say, I, I am very much a crack the market kind of person. Um, I want to. I feel strongly about it with my own fiction and I get pretty stubborn about it. Um, and I don't think that's a bad thing. And I also don't think it's, I, I guess what I would say is that it should be a market where you like what they publish, right? And you resonate with it. it you know, it's, it's sort of pointless to be like, well, I wanna crack this market because whatever, for whatever yeah. other reason. If Hate you don't, submitting wastes everybody's time. Right. So if you don't like the work that they're doing, A, you're probably not going to be a good fit and B, you know, like you're not going to be that satisfied anyway at the end of it, even if you make it in. But if you like what they're doing, and, and maybe this is a, a little bit about how flexible you are as a writer, perhaps, and about developing your voice and, but also your range. I think there is something worthwhile about, you know, uh, being able to write an uncanny story, being able to write an Asimov story, being able to write a Strange Horizon story or an analog story. And it's not like they're uniform in each of those magazines, clearly, but there are some big differences between them. And I think it's kind of, I feel like it's good for me as a writer to stretch myself in those ways, to try to write. I, I'd be very, very satisfied if I wrote an analog story and published it. Um, so... That's that's my argument for cracking. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a valid argument and I want to add on to it, Marianne, because <laughs> um, one of the things that I love to see is when we say send the next story and the next story comes in and it's completely different from the last story by the same author. We love that because that means that you are stretching your writing muscles and mm -hmm. you are working in different directions and you are thinking about things differently and you are experimenting and the stuff that we love at uncanny are the experiments that work but like all science the experiment only works you know a <laughs> tiny percentage of the time yeah. yeah but that's the kind of stuff that we absolutely adore you know we i've often done like workshop scenarios where um folks are being are sort of working through multiple stories. And you know, one of the best things you can do is when you write the next story to decide, okay, this is the story, because short stories are not the same level of involvement and investment of time as say a novel. So mm -hmm. like, if you decide that this is the week you wanna work on writing in second person, because that would be interesting. And the next story you write, you decide that you really wanna work on making the prose prettier. And the next story that you write, you decide you really want to work on making a fascinating main character who is not actually likable. Then you've built three sets of skills that when you get to the fourth story that happens to be second person, not very likable, but with really beautiful prose, boom, you just got bought. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, and so I, I want to jump off that, I think, just to recap some of the things you've, you've talked about one, what Judd said about new ideas, and, and maybe just sort of emphasize, someone asked me in the panel last week, uh, Ben Rosenbaum and I did a panel on where do you get your ideas, and um, <laughs> someone asked me about one of my specific stories and I that I'd published at Clark's World, and I had to admit, a little embarrassed, that I had taken a Heinlein idea and a Diane Duane idea and mashed them up together for my cool new idea for my story, he, Neil bought the story for Clark's World, so clearly it worked reasonably well. But, you know, you don't, I feel like there's some people who throw off brilliant new ideas constantly, even if you're not one of those people, and I'm not, sometimes you can put some things together in interesting new ways. So I just wanted to, to throw that out there as a, a possibility. Um, well, it's not necessarily always about new ideas. Sometimes it's about new and different perspectives on old ideas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, or, that's, or, that's another way to approach it because we all have different lived experiences and part of, 
part of one of the most important movements over the past 20 years in the field has been the diversification of the field and providing many more venues that, that are looking for many more perspectives that were not as heavily represented in the earlier history of the field. And so, you know, one of the things, I mean, Uncanny does things like we publish um, reworkings of fairy tales all the dang time. Um, you know, but we publish reworkings of fairy tales and folk tales from multiple cultures, not just Western culture. Um, and we publish folk tales and fairy tales that are from very different perspectives um, that change in perspective can be what makes the story new in terms of ideas because you get different outcomes, you get different emotions, you get different feelings, you get different thematics when the point of view of the person telling the story changes, even if it's a story that is as old as dirt in terms of the central idea. Lynn, now I want to tell you, send you a story from the point of view of like the toadstool. Like, surely I can make that interesting. <laughs> That's fine. I just line, I just line edited a Rumpelstiltskin story from the point of view of the character of Rumpelstiltskin that, yeah. that S.B. Divya did. And it's going to be amazing in the next issue. It's yeah, so it's good. Terrific. Nice. Yeah. So, so I, I agree with all of that. I, I also want to note that when I said newness, I didn't necessarily mean new, new ideas mm -hmm. um, that, that just, you know, prose appro approaches to prose that I haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. um, I, in some contexts, I mean, we, we never actually published a hypertext story at Strange Horizons, but we were always, we always thought about it um, and, and characters and, you know, all sorts of things can be new. Yeah. Like uh, the structure, totally a thing. Yeah. Like if you land it, that's the, th the hard part. Yes. The, the, yes. The, the challenge is always, it is totally fine and cool to do literary tricks as it were, mess with the structure, mess with the timeline, um, mess with what we think of as how that story is supposed to work, but you have to stick the landing. That's the, that's the yeah. hard part. If you try those kinds of tricks, you have to be able to carry them off because not carrying it off is gonna get you rejected in favor of a story that did carry it off. That's just how it goes. Okay, I am, I'm gonna to touch on one thing and I'm gonna ask you guys one more question and then I'm gonna open it up for Q and A. Um, the, the last thing I wanted to touch on was just, um, Lynn had been talking about prose style and the ways, um, and that sort of tricky balancing act between having a um, elegant prose style and word salad. Um, we used to, the elegant pro style, the, we, we used to talk about finely crafted sentences in grad school, uh, and it got to be a little bit of a cliche in the MFA program of like, there should be something more than finely crafted sentences to your story, but there was much emphasis on that, right? Literary prose quality is uh, a big deal in MFA programs. Um, one thing that I see a lot in people who are um, first starting to write fiction is there are people who love fiction, they love stories, they love words a lot of the time. And that's, I think, where some of the word salad stuff comes is that they really want to use iridescent in a sentence. They really want to use liminal. I mean, you know, so, and and sometimes you'll get sentences that throw in, you know, twenty hundred dollar words all at once. Um, so my, my recommendation for catching that to some extent for yourself is reading your final draft out loud, I think helps tremendously because you start, you will stumble over the words if you try and read one of those sentences out loud. Um, and it can be, it can be, uh, it can be helpful. And again, I, again, I feel like I need to caveat, it's possible, Nabokov can do it, it's Delaney can do it, you can write a sentence with a whole bunch of fancy, fancy words in it and have it be fabulous. But I think that's a high level of skill. <laughs> so, Jed, do you, you look like you want to throw something in. I, I want to throw in two things. One is that I, I partly disagree about reading aloud. I think that that's that can be super useful, but I also think that there are various prose styles that just don't work particularly well aloud, and um, that that doesn't necessarily mean that um, that you should change it. Um, the other thing is that, in addition to the level of skill thing that you just mentioned. There's also, again, the, the matter of taste. I'm thinking in particular of Mervyn Peake, uh, who, uh, the, the author of the Gorman Gas trilogy, whose sentences are amazing and, 
and completely bizarre. And I posted a, a Facebook post a while back in which I listed half a dozen quotes and said, you know, this for me just teeters right on the edge of being too purple, but doesn't quite fall over. And I got half a dozen responses from people saying it does fall over. So um, it, it really is going to depend on, on yep. the person who's reading. It. And there, and there are literary styles over time as well, right? Sure. So that's another factor that goes into this. My, my daughter is reading Dickens' Great Expectations for school right now, freshman in high school. And we actually got a letter home from the English teacher at the start of the semester saying, just kind of warning us about the prose style and how our kids were going to have to learn to slow down and read a little more patiently, not try to read Dickens while watching TV. It wasn't going to go well, et cetera. So um, Anyway, so things that were stylistically popular in earlier centuries are maybe less so now and vice versa. The question I wanted to ask, I wanna, I'm gonna switch tracks this last question before Q&A. Um, I wanted to ask about a phrase you used, Lynn, um, connecting with characters and Jed used it, I think as well. And I'm pretty sure I have used it. Um, and I was, as I was listening to you, I was thinking, how would I translate that into advice to the writer, right? Like it's one thing to know that editors want to connect with the characters. How do you write a character that someone's going to connect with? Are there techniques? Are there things that the writer does that help you connect with them? Um, is there, you know, and I, and I guess I'm, I'm thinking a little bit in terms of connecting it to prose styles and YA, one of the things that I've been seeing um, from editors of YA fiction has been an emphasis on kind of immediacy, vulnerability, um, overt emotionality um, in a way that was not true of say the Le Guin or the like, like Wrinkle in Time that I read when I was a kid, like the style mm -hmm. has changed a lot. So I'm kind of- See, I find it more interesting that. because I, I think of Wrinkle in Time as very, I think of Meg Murray from Wrinkle in Time as deeply emotional, but I'm also someone who glommed onto her as a, as a baseline character when I read her at the time, so. She's deeply emotional, but she doesn't, but she doesn't like put all the emotion out there in the way that a lot of contemporary yeah. YA does, right? That's, yeah, style, that's, that's fair. Style yeah. is different, right? So she feels yeah. things very intensely. Yes. Um, yeah, I think that for me, um, what, makes what makes characters resonate um, is the ability to answer some questions. What do they want? Mm -hmm. Why do they want it? Why should I care? What are the stakes if they don't get it? Mm -hmm. Does it matter if what they got isn't what they wanted, but it turned out to be what they needed? <laughs> and how do they feel about it? And I mean, there, there are lots of different ways to answer those questions, but ultimately when I'm trying to figure out whether I connect with a character or not, it doesn't necessarily matter to me as an editor if they're like overtly emotional or they're more internalized. That's not necessarily a, a deal breaker one way or the other. It's not necessarily whether it's first person or third person or second person. Um, it's about making sure that I understand why this little puppet is going through these particular motions um, and why they're making the choices that they make. And I have a particular pet peeve about characters being forced to hold the, we refer to it colloquially as the idiot ball, although that is an ableist term. Um, it is the, the thing where a character makes a choice that is a very bad choice that it can only come out of the fact that they haven't been paying attention to their own actions in the story or anyone mm -hmm. else's that they but the plot requires that choice to be made in order to move the plot forward that kind of thing is something that irks me because i want characters to make choices that make sense in the context of who that character is and what they want they may not be good choices in fact a lot of the most interesting stories come when characters make terrible choices you know, Outlander as a novel series is like bad decision-making theater, the novels. It's great because of that. But to Jamie and Claire in those novels, all of the choices make complete sense because humans are really, really good at convincing ourselves that things that are objectively bad ideas are actually great ideas. This is, how, this is why we do things like bungee jumping because we're like, that sounds amazing. I'm gonna just fling myself off of a height and see what happens with a string that's bendy, that's, that's, you know, bouncy. So that's the kind of stuff that I'm looking for in terms of connecting with characters. I wanna know the why. I wanna know why they're making these choices. I wanna know why they are moving in this direction as opposed to that direction. Um, those are the things that help me connect with characters as an editor is understanding the why. 
um, because the why tells me who they are. It tells me about their ethics. It tells me about their worldview. It tells me about their relationships because that's what drives us humans. Yeah. Jed, do you wanna? So I, um, I'm trying to figure out which of these threads I wanna, I wanna start with. <laughs> um, I'll start by saying that, that I think that one particular technique that can be really useful for me as a reader, um, sorry, a, a writing technique that, that is useful to me as a reader in, in identifying emotional engagement with a character is seeing other characters care about that character. Um, mm -hmm. That, that <clears throat> can work really well as almost a shortcut to like, oh, this character is somebody who's worth caring about. Sometimes it can backfire if the reader can't understand why the other people would care about that character. But um, it, I, I think that that's an, a common thread in a lot of things that work well for me. Um, to touch on one particular thing that what, what, of what Lynn said, which I agree with everything you said, um, uh, I think that the why should I care question is the most important one for me. And, I, and in some ways, maybe the hardest for a writer to, um, to write. I think that, that one of the ways that writers do that is to put a character into a situation that the reader can empathize with, um, that the reader can think, oh, yeah, I've been in that situation. I, I recognize that, it, or a situation kind of like it. Um, I recognize that it's that it's a difficult situation. Uh, this would be a hard choice to make. I can, you know, feel um, what the the character is is feeling. And I think one particular as or one particular example of the kind of thing you were talking about about people making bad choices is uh, Pixar's story structure. There was a, a great video in one of the attached to one of the Pixar movies on on DVD uh, that talked about their kind of template their their story structure template and only they only talked about act one of a movie but they among other things it involved a character making a bad choice but it being a bad choice that grew out of that character's flaws and weaknesses that we could recognize that we could say oh yeah boy if i were in that situation i'd make the same bad choice ouch rather than oh my god what are you doing that's a terrible choice don't do that yeah, it's kind of like the opposite of like horror films where you know yes. the characters are like, you know, there's there are now commercials that mock horror films. So they're like, let's go into that space with there where there's nothing but running buzz saws. It'll be great. We'll hide there. Like, you know, that's the kind of thing where, yeah, I want if characters are going to make bad choices, I want them to come out of who they are. Because that's what makes them human. I I, I would just add in that there are some very, very common themes that are surprisingly effective even after all this time, right? So girl meets boy, I, I see this in my student stories all the time. They set up a potential romance in just like, you've just met these people. It's the first page and there's somebody and there's somebody else who they're potentially interested in. It's very hard not to get engaged in that, <laughs> right? It's just such a fundamental cultural, human, whateverness you know, even though you don't know anything about these people at all, you're like, yeah, go get the girl, go get her, you know, and then, um, you know, and then as the story progresses, you may change your mind about whether they should get the girl or not. But, but that it's a very effective hook, putting a child in danger, very effective hook, you know, um, I, they may have relied on a little too much in some of my fiction, but, but, but so you can think a little bit about what are the what are some, if not universals, but very common human experiences um, that we're going to tend to relate to and, and see whether any of them work for your story, perhaps. But I would, I would, I agree, but I would say that A, it's easy to go way too far in those and, and for the audience to feel emotionally manipulated. Um, and B, that if you're going to do that, then you should think about emotional reactions in the real world. Just as an example, I have seen a lot of stories over the years in which a character's parents die and the next paragraph, they're fine. And in, in real life, for most people, if their parents die, they're going to be emotionally devastated for a long time. And you may not be able to tell the story that you wanna tell with a character who has been through that if you, if you want to show them grieving in a realistic way. So, um, so think about the the emotional consequences of whatever you're putting your characters through. Yeah. 
And, you know, I think Lynn referred to carrying the idiot ball. We really have got to come up with a better term for this that's less yeah. able because I was, um, Turkey City Lexicon refers to this as the idiot plot, essentially, right? I think that's a, their term for it, where the story only works if everyone in the story is an idiot. Um, and the second order idiot plot is it only works if everyone on the planet is an idiot. So they're useful concepts. We just need better terms for it. Um, I, I will say romance, I think, is often to some extent kind of predicated on people starting that way, right? That they are... Um, they're making terrible choices that you can see are terrible choices. And the course of the novel is them learning better, right? So that they can become people who earn their happy ending, right? So, And to some degree, this goes back to what you're saying about genre, that there are genre conventions and in romance, that's one of them. Yeah. So, I mean, Pride and Prejudice, I think is a good example, yeah. right? Their, their flaws are in the titles. <laughs> and... <laughs> You know, that's that's the whole point is that they are deeply flawed in those ways and then they learn better. OK, so um, I'd like to shift to Q&A, a couple of housekeeping things. Um, Darius reminded me that I was supposed to remind everyone that if you are enjoying this panel and would like us to see more of this kind of thing, we encourage you to join the SLF during our current membership drive. It's two dollars a month. Um, and it is essentially helping us move to a position where we can pay part-time staff like Darius um, to be our back-end tech support and organizing and sending out the emails and all the things that make it possible to do this. So uh, we'd love to have you join us. Details on the website, speclit.org. Um, and then the other thing is it's 2.52. Um, I think we'd originally scheduled this to go till three Chicago time, uh, but I do not have a hard stop. Um, so I would like to I'll be here till 3.30. Um, I just wanted to check in with Lynn and Jed if you guys had hard stops at some point before that. Not particularly, no. no. I can go a little over. I'm not quite sure how much, but yeah, at least some. Okay. Yeah, Leave, if, we, if, we, if we maybe wind up at like 3.15, that would be ideal, but I could go till 3.30 if I had to. Okay. Yeah, I think okay. That we, can, we can aim for that. Okay, so good. So, um, and so far, there's only one question in the Q&A, although we can just keep talking. Um, but we'll start with the question. Ashley asks, oh, and actually, um, just so people have the option to like raise their hand and ask questions verbally, I think I'm going to have Darius, can you unspotlight us now so that we can see if someone uses the raised hand function? Um, so hmm. it's going to go to the whole gallery view. I encourage you all to use gallery view so you can see everybody. Feel free to turn on your video if you'd like, but um, you can use the reaction raise hand if you'd like us to call on you, or you can throw typed questions in the chat. Either way is fine. Um, I'm going to start with Ashley's question in the chat. Should we respond to editors' personal rejections? And she says non-desktop rejections. I'm not quite sure what she means by non-desktop. I'm guessing that means non-form rejections? Yeah, OK. So like it's gotten to the editor and you got something that wasn't just a straight up form. Is that correct, Ashley? Yes. yes. OK. Um, again, it's the email problem. So um, my preference, and this may vary, but my preference is if you got a personalized rejection, anything further than thanks is not going to be um, helpful um, unless you have a specific question about the feedback that you got that you didn't understand. Um, it's always okay to ask for clarification because when we're giving feedback, we are attempting to be helpful. So if I'm not articulating as an editor, the thing that needs to be worked on in that story, mm -hmm. um, then it's totally fair to be like, well, okay, that doesn't quite make sense. Can you explain it a little more? But if it's, you know, but it's a matter of, if we're saying something like, I mean, the kind of feedback you get is gonna vary. So it's, it's really hard to make a determination. Um, but if it's something along the lines of, we really like this, but we didn't feel that the ending was earned. Right, which is a common thing where like you get two thirds of the way through the story and then it just kind of falls off a cliff and then the ending doesn't make sense in the context of the rest of the story. Um, or the characters made choices that shouldn't have led to the ending you picked. Um, you know, our job as editors is to point to the path and to say, maybe try a different path. But we can't tell you which path is the correct path. I can't tell you what the right ending is because I won't know until you write it and I see it. But I can tell you that the ending that you did pick didn't work. 
Yeah. Um, so it, it's always kind of a balancing act. But in a general sense, if you are going to if you are going to respond, it's because you're requesting specific clarification of the feedback that you got because the feedback doesn't make sense to your brain. Um, but that's it. You, it's not impolite to just accept the the rejection and move on to sending out the next story that I hope you will send back to that market that just gave you a very nice personalized rejection. That's the best way to respond to a personalized rejection is to send that market when they open the next story. So I would, I have a question for you both. I, I feel like there's two main kinds of personalized rejections, um, like two categories. One category is the, you know, I, there are a lot of things I liked about this story. I hope you send us your next story kind of thing. Um, this one didn't quite work for us. And the other kind is the, the are these specific things that were issues. And, um, and if you would like to revise, we'd be happy to have you resubmit. That's not a and, rejection though. That's a revise and resubmit. That's what well, so I wanted to like, yeah. like so make that the, well, and, and sometimes, and I would say, I, I would just say, I have occasionally gotten letters from editors where it was not clear which one it right. was, and I've written back for clarification, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and one of the things we are careful about at Uncanny is that if it is a revise and resubmit, we will say in the first sentence, this is a revise and resubmit. We try to be very explicit about that because it's honestly not something we do that often, yeah. um, mainly for the reason that if I can't articulate to you what needs fixing in the story, then the chances of you fixing it to match up with what the version of the story that is potential that lives in my head looks like are very slim. Um, generally, you would get something very specific along, this, along the lines of, these are the things we love about this, but it's very hard to tell what kind of space these characters are moving in. Can you describe the space a little bit better? Like you'll get something super specific like that, where it's just one aspect that's not quite working. But if we can't articulate that, then it's not fair to you to be like, rewrite it and see what happens. Mm -hmm. So we, we are very careful about revise and resubmits and being specific about them. And we were too at Strange Horizons, but there were times when we sent what we intended to be just a rejection and got back a query saying, if I change these, you know, we, we would send a, a, a personalized rejection saying, here are a couple of things that didn't work for us. And we'd, we'd sometimes get back questions saying, if I change those things, can I resubmit it? Um, and we always we always had mixed feelings about that. Lynn, do you have thoughts about, do you get those? In a general sense, if I think that it is fixable with minimal work, I'm gonna send a revise and resubmit because yeah. I think that that's something where I can have clarity with that writer. If I don't think, if the things that didn't work are broad enough that it would require a structural reworking of the story or, another two passes of rewrites, um, I am unlikely to want to see that story again, um, unless, unless there's something I really adored about it. And it's always, it's always subjective and it's always hard to tell. Um, but in a general sense, don't, I, don't think that, I don't think that writers should get into the practice of writing to markets or rewriting based on the feedback you get from a market because the feedback you're gonna get from me is gonna be different than the feedback you're gonna get from Jed is gonna be different from the feedback that you're gonna get from Marianne. So if you send it to me and I say, gosh, the ending doesn't work. And then you rewrite the ending and the, send it on to Jed. And he's like, wow, that ending doesn't work. And it's a different ending. <laughs> so now you've got two endings that don't work. And then you send it on to Marianne and she's like, well, that ending doesn't work. Now you've written three endings, none of which work. And none of our feedback was all that helpful. Although I, I, I mentioned, I mean, you know, like it's just possible that all the endings don't work, right? That all yeah. of you are correctly identifying that the writer has not yet written an ending that works for the story, right? right. So um, Judd, you were, sorry, I cut you off. I, th I think I would say that as with, for instance, workshop feedback, it, it should be, the author should think about whether that feedback will, whether addressing that feedback will make it a better story in their opinion. Yeah. And if so, then go ahead. There was, there was in particular one case where we gave a fairly detailed personalized rejection to a story at Strange Horizons. We did not ask for a revise because we didn't, we didn't, as you were saying, Lynn, we didn't think that that was going to work for us. The author took our, our comments to heart and revised it and sent it to another market where it was published and won various awards. So um, that, that can, I, I agree about not not just rewriting because an editor says this doesn't work for me. But if you think it's the right thing to do, then certainly. 
And I, if I'm remembering, Chad, there was at least one story where you had sent comments and the writer completely rewrote the story and sent you, you know, almost, I don't know if you remember this, it was pretty early days of Strange Horizons, but sent you something you loved and published, I think. Uh, that there, there are a couple of different things maybe mixed in there. One is that um, Ellen Datlow once showed us a rejection that she had sent to a Pat Cadigan story. Well, I guess it was a revise. Um, she said, um, so Pat, could you revise this? And she wasn't really very clear about what she wanted revised. And Pat completely rewrote it from scratch and sent in a much better story. Um, we, we had seen similar kinds of things once or twice, um, but I think that that's rare and even rarer that it would actually work, um, given, as Lynn said, that if you don't know what it was that didn't work for the editor, then it's it's hard to change it in ways that they'll like. I feel like when that happens, it, it, it's because the editor has made the writer aware that yeah. that wasn't working. And then the writer was like, oh, of course it's not working. I know how to fix this. And yeah. this is what I should have done in the first place. And they go off and do it anyway. Okay. Let me, let me, we've got two more questions. I want to make yeah. sure we have the time for these. So um, Gemma asks, picking up on your comments on wanting to see new perspectives on old ideas. Are there any old ideas you're sick of seeing? Or any new perspectives that you're seeing too much of? I suppose a better way to put it maybe is if you're seeing any emerging tropes. I almost feel like that's that's maybe a different question. So there's there's both the the kind of classic things you've seen too much of, things that, you know, I don't know about emerging tropes is maybe a little different, but I'll I'll throw it to you too. Yeah, I would say that on at Uncanny, I don't know that there are necessarily things we've seen too much of per se. Um, that are like specific tropes or types of stories or anything like that. I think it's more, um, I think it's more challenging than that simply because of the sheer volume of stories that comes in. Like one of the things I often joke about is that when you are in a magazine that has open submissions that are not tied to any particular theme, you can tell when themed anthologies close because you get 25 of the same kind of story <laughs> all at once that got rejected from the anthology. Like the first thing that happens when a underwater basket weaving anthology closes is that everybody who had an underwater basket weaving story that got rejected thinks, oh, well, maybe I can send it elsewhere and get it published somewhere else. And when we have 25 underwater basket weaving stories, I'm gonna choose one at best, maybe. Um, it doesn't mean I hate underwater basket weaving. It just means there's too much of a good thing here and you know, not all of it's necessarily gonna resonate. Um, we, I don't know that there are perspectives I've seen too much of per se. I, I think that there are perspectives that we gravitate towards more and perspectives that we gravitate towards less in terms of our collective personal taste as editors. Um, but like we've published vampire stories, we've published zombie stories, we've published stories about witches and fairy tales and robots and brains in jars. And, you know, like there's there's nothing that's off limits. It's a matter of matching up the thing you want to tell the story about with a skill set that tells the story in a way that's compelling to us. But I don't think other than like I'm not particularly keen personally on stories that feature violence against women. Um, I, I, part of that is that um, you may know that I was an editor for Apex Magazine for a while, which is a horror magazine. And one of the things that you deal with with horror is a lot of uh, rape in particular that goes into horror. Um, and it's just not something I'm particularly keen on reading stories about. So that's, but that's totally a, like, there are effective stories that talk about rape. For me as a reader, I'm gonna need that story to be knocking my socks off when it does the thing because a B-level story that does that is not gonna to be to my taste. But that's me as an editor. That doesn't necessarily mean that you should never do that. It's just that. In the same way that like writing about libraries, which is my day job, is a double-edged sword because if you get it right, I'm gonna go, ooh, shiny. And if you get it wrong, that's not so good. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be more peeved because it's a thing I have expertise in in the same way that someone who knows a lot about horses or a lot about guns gets irritated when those things are handled poorly in stories. Find yourself a librarian to consult with first before sending <laughs> Lynn. So, Jed, do you wanna add anything there? I, I think that the, the thing that I have written that has gotten 
that has been seen by the most people is the stories we've seen too often list from Strange Horizons um, back in the in the days when I was there. And uh, it was widely misunderstood as a list of bad story types, but we tried to be very clear that it was in fact, just what the title said, it was a list of things that we had seen a lot and that we were, as, as time went on, increasingly unlikely to be interested in because we had just seen too many of them. Um, I think that the the general thing that all, and that's still available online, Strange Horizons kept it around, even though it's not true for the current editors because they haven't seen those particular things. But I think that the general thing that, that I'll say is that surprise twist endings of all sorts um, are, are a very hard sell for me and for a lot of editors. With the caveat that what Lynn said earlier, that that a an ending, an unexpected ending that grows organically out of the story is great. And that can be a hard distinction to make, but but there are certain specific types of surprise twists that we used to see a lot, and I think that changes over time. You know, in the in the old days, um, it used to be that that deal with the devil stories were extremely common. Um, we used to get a lot of um, hunter hunted stories where somebody who you think is the vampire's victims turns out to be an uber vampire and kills the vampire, um, and and so I, I think that there are sort of trends in those over time. Uh, a lot of them don't give the reader enough credit. I feel like the ones that, mm. that don't work, they're kind of like cheap or, you know, like cheap twists, right. Where um, it's not satisfying. I think people who work in, in the mystery genre have to spend a lot of time thinking about how do you do this well, so that when you reveal who the murderer is, you know, perhaps it's a surprise, but it also feels inevitable. Right. I think you, right. you mentioned that before, Lynn, like that's such an important part of mystery. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's very difficult to do. Um, I wanted to add two things about anthologies because we have two magazine editors here. Um, one is that to jump back to the um, to the earlier thing I meant to say, magazine editors who are getting constantly flooded year round with stories have, I think, in general, less time to do multiple revisions with an author. Whereas when I'm editing an anthology, it's generally a short, maybe two month submission period, then it closes. And then I have as much time as I want, unless I'm on a deadline to work with an author. So, you know, one of the anthologies I edited, Nisi Shal sent in a story that had a, a great seed, completely didn't work. It was fairly early in her career. This was 20 years or so ago. And we went through four revisions back and forth, and then I ended up buying it in the end. So I, I do think that there is maybe a little more room with anthologies for that kind of editorial work. Um, and then the what I wanted to say about anthologies connecting here to the, um, I just wanted to give an example, um, but for theme anthologies, I think what happens when, so I put out a call for water related erotica stories. Okay, so if you take a second and think, okay, what kind of story would I write? Quite possibly the first thing that pops into mind is, oh, a mermaid story, right? I will tell you that is the first thing that pops into most people's minds. And so as a result, I got a couple hundred submissions and something like 75% of them were mermaid stories. Well, in an anthology of 20 stories, I'm maybe gonna publish two at most mermaid stories, more probably one. So everyone who took another five seconds to think of something beyond their first thought had a much better chance of getting into the anthology. So um, just that's a specific thing for theme anthologies to be aware of, right? Honestly, so. that also works for the kind of storytelling that we love at Uncanny. I mean, when I talk about, you know, having your ending be completely inevitable, but a surprise, it's that kind of thinking yeah. where you're putting together your story and your structure and you're seeding things. And the outcome is utterly inevitable, but it is not the first thing I think of as I'm going through the story. Yeah. It's the second or third or seventh. Mm -hmm. but it makes complete sense in terms of the structure that you've built. Yeah. And another way that that kind of thing can apply in, even in magazines is that the first story or two that we received that were selkie stories, we loved and we published them. And then we started seeing more selkie stories and then we started seeing more selkie stories. And by the time I left, I think we were getting maybe a dozen selkie stories a year and, and the bar went way up. We were much less interested in publishing those just because we had published so many of them. Yeah, that, that I think is one of the big things with magazines and anthologies that are themed versus not themed is that when you see a lot of one kind of story, the bar for which of those stories you're going to select for publication goes up very, very much because you're now comparing apples to apples. 
as opposed to comparing apples to bananas and oranges. Um, you know, if if I'm making a fruit salad, which is basically an, a magazine issue, <laughs> you know, I it, you're you're looking for different textures and different colors and different and different um, cellular structures. So you get some crunch and some squish and some some sweet and some less sweet, right? You you are trying to curate that as a whole. So different kinds of stories fit together in different ways. But if I've got 20 stories that are all exactly on the same theme and more or less going in the same direction, I'm gonna maybe pick the one that's the best of the lot. And then the rest of them are not gonna be there because they don't hold up in comparison to the other. So, you know, it's the thing of like, if all you have is apples, you better give me a honey crisp, right? But if you're making a fruit salad, maybe a gala apple or a green apple is what I actually need here. Yeah. Or I now feel like we should be throwing in alien fruit as well, right? Yes, that's entirely <laughs> fair. I just couldn't think of a good example off the top of my head. I know, I was, I was trying to think of alien fruit. I feel like I should be able to name a Klingon fruit, and I'm just failing right hmm. now. Like, you know, like Vulcan plomake soup. Is plomake a fruit? It could be. It could be a vegetable. It could be, some, well, I think they're vegetarians, so probably it's a fruit or a vegetable. Anyway, um, okay, <laughs> let me just get, I'm going to get Beth's question in. We're going to be very close to time. So hers is quick. So I, you might be able to squeeze one in. If anyone else has a question, throw it in the chat now. Um, Beth asks, in general, if an editor accepts a story from an author, is it okay for that author to send another story to the slush pile right away? Or is it better to wait until the story is published before sending something new? I'm going to give you, my answer is, um, I, I think it's absolutely okay to send them another story right away. I might give them a week or two of breathing room um, before I barrage them with another story, but but that's but I don't think there's any real reason to wait. Lynn, Jen? I would say yes, with the caveat that story number two, if it is also accepted, will will spend a lot more time sitting in inventory because yeah. we te we tend we try not to publish repeat authors right next to each other. So. It's with the knowledge that, yeah, you might sell two stories to the same market, but they might not come up, they might come out a year apart from one another. Yeah. Um, that's the thing to keep in mind. But as long as there's still the market is still open to submissions, there's nothing stopping you. Mm -hmm. That's a great point about the delaying publication. Yeah. I would also say that depending on on the venue and their particular backlog, if you send in a story today, the editors might not see it for a month. Um, you know, they fair. might. They, it, some editors are going to read it that day, but. Uh, uh, it, there, there can be a delay. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're, you're probably going to be in an email correspondence with the editor at this point. So, I mean, I might, well, I think I, I typically would, you know, as part of that email correspondence mentioned that like, Hey, and I just submitted another story to you. So, yeah. which then gives them the option if they want to go hunt it up in their big queue, they can, and if not, it'll show up eventually. Right. So, um, so, okay, well, we are very close to 3.15, so I think we will wrap up. Um, thank you so much, Lynn and Jed. Uh, Jed, thanks for the last minute pinch hitting. We really appreciate it. Uh, Lynn, always a delight having you here. Um, if y'all ever make it to the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana, Lynn is the archivist there, rare books collection, fabulous stuff. Um, and I'm, I think you have quite a few online exhibits as well. So people we're can building that. Yes. So yes. Um, there we're I'm the head of the rare book and manuscript library. And we've got we've got a Star Wars exhibit that's online right now that's online as well as a Jane Austen exhibit to give you an idea of our breadth of collections. Nice. So um, so is there anything any last things that either of you want to pimp before we let you go? Um, I just want to say it's important to actually also not only read magazines, but financially support them. The thing that is important to remember is that just about every magazine that is not corporate owned, which is most of the magazines in SFF, we are running on exceedingly thin margins and the editorial team is underpaid if they're paid at all. Um, and it's important to understand that none of us are getting rich at this. We are all doing this because we care about short fiction and we think it's important. And the best way to help keep these markets going is to support us by subscribing, by talking about us, by, by supporting us in other ways. And yes, right, money flows to the writer. We all believe that as markets that are worth our salt. At the same time, the more readers you help us get, the more money flows to the writers. So um, that financial support can't be assumed. 
You know, yeah. a lot of us have to spend a fair amount of time beating the drum and that's that can be frustrating because that's time we're not spending reading stories, editing stories, critiquing stories. We're running small businesses and they are very thin margins. The only thing with thinner margins is running a restaurant, honestly, so. Yeah, and I would say if, you, if you're if you not, in a, both Uncanny and Strange Horizons do annual Kickstarters, um, or maybe is it annual? I think it's annual uh, for both of those. But uh, in addition, I would just emphasize, if you, know, if you read a story at one of these publications that you love, talk it up. Word of mouth is super important. Um, talk it up on social media, tell your friends, especially these days, as a lot of the social media places have gotten very good at using algorithms to try and get people to monetize stuff it's much harder to get organic reach than it used to be. So um, anything you can do to spread the word um, is very much appreciated from all of us. Um, speaking of which, next week, same time, same place. Actually, it might be a different Zoom place. I'm not sure, but somewhere in Zoom land that we will send out the link. I'll be talking with um, Ellen Kushner of uh, who wrote Swords Point, the brilliant Swords Point, and about her shared world, Tremontaine. Um, and with uh, Walter John Williams and David DeLevine about uh, George R. R. Martin's wildcard series, both of which I write for. <laughs> so although I'm going to try and play moderator again for the most part, um, although as you can see, I have a hard time not sticking my oar in. Um, I try. This is why I give myself the moderator name. So I don't talk. If I didn't, I would talk even more. Um, so, <laughs> so thanks to Lynn and Jed for their patience. Um, Jed, you look like you want to throw in. One last thing. I wanted to make a closing statement, <clears throat> um, which will be uh, expanding on something that Lynn said earlier, um, which is that it is very easy from a writer's perspective to see an editor as um, a gatekeeper who is getting in the way of you getting published and and of edit of writers seeing your brilliance. And I, <clears throat> I think that that can lead to a kind of an antagonistic um, feeling to, to that relationship when you're when you're trying to get published and so i think that that it can help a lot if you think of the editor as somebody who is um potentially on your side and and a colleague and um and someone to work with rather than to fight against and science always here to make your story the best possible version of the story that it can be that's yeah. always the goal because that's what we're putting your name and our name on when we publish it and we are a very small pond in science fiction and fantasy. Yeah. Like, yeah. You, you know, there, there really aren't that many of us and we get to know each other quickly. So um, eventually you'll end up hopefully at a convention sharing a drink with, uh, with your editor. That's always lovely. So, um, okay. Thank you all for coming. And uh, yeah, I think that's it. See you. Hopefully we'll see a lot of you next week. So, and go check out Uncanny and Strange Horizons. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye.